Rubin from the Hebrew University and the Weizmann Institute of Science. And uh, we'll talk about an analog of the Ichino Ike conjecture for Whitaker coefficients of the middle point of truth. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here to see many people around. Uh, so let me begin with the original Ichino Ikeda conjecture, which at least some of you I'm sure have heard of. The new things I'm going to speak about are all uh, joined with the uh, Zheng Yu Mao from Rutgers. So what is it about? Well, you start with the quadratic space over a number field, V. You look at its orthogonal group or special orthogonal group, depends on your taste. You take a vector, uh, an anisotropic vector, and it's uh, <coughs> perpendicular space, a hyperplane. So the stabilizer is a smaller orthogonal group of different parity. And now you take a, a cuspidal representation on the bigger group cuspidal representation of the smaller group. And OK, so we give ourselves a kind of a heavy assumption that uh, pi and sigma are tempered at all places. So they are, or if you prefer, they are of Ramanujan type. But it's better uh, to assume more. In any case, it's a conjecture. So we're allowed to assume what you want. <coughs> and what does the conjecture say? I would first write, I mean, with my beautiful handwriting and then explain what's going on. So uh, you take this period, oops, no, it's hard to coordinate. Yeah, okay. So you take this period where you restrict uh, a cast form on pi, namely on the big orthogonal group to the smaller orthogonal group. You integrate it against uh, the smaller orthogonal group against another cast form on the smaller one. Uh, you look, so this is called the period just a name, and then you uh, look at the absolute value square of that. Well, so the, this conjecture is a kind of a local to global principle for this period. What does it say? It says that grosso modo this period square is this L function at the top. What is this L function? It's, uh, it's really supposed to mean the L function after you lift to the appropriate GLN, and then you take ranking Selberg type at one half the center of symmetry. You have to divide by uh, something uh, simpler, the Jones-Hill function. Is one. The yeah, upper S means it's the partial L function. Sure. Yeah, so it's not, we're not yet done. So this is outside S, and now what happens at the bad places well, you have, this is still a global object. It's the Peterson inner product of uh, phi and phi two, phi one and phi two. There are, there are some uh, simple factors which I will not discuss, but there is this uh, interesting factor of two to the minus beta. Uh, yeah, so this is just integrated over the local group, but these are the global inner products. So this is basically the integral of the matrix coefficient over the local group. And of course, Yeah, so part of the deal is that this totally converges. So le let me make a few remarks. I mean, there's a metric coefficient. Is Assume the tempered, of course. This tempered means a locally, locally converged. Yeah, H of Fs, this is the local. Oh, just F plus F. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's a global, the object is, <laughs> but it's basically local, right? But um, anyways, <coughs> it's a. Uh, so let me make a few remarks about this, uh, this formulation and this conjecture. I mean, you have to get used to it, of course, uh, if you haven't seen it. it. At the beginning, it looks like a tautology, but it's certainly not a tautology. I mean, already the fact that there is two to the beta <laughs> tells you that something interesting is going on. <laughs> Anyways, um, <clears throat> so let me make a few remarks. So the first remark is that uh, you can view this 2 to the beta as the size of the centralizer in the, in the Langlands dual, or the connected part, if you like, of the image of the parameter of pi, 
or a parameter attached to pi, if you like. So these are parameters of the Langlands uh, hypothetical group. So it looks very hypothetical here, but uh, one can make it a more uh, kind of down to earth. Uh, this object. Anyway, this is some power of two, some interesting power of two, but usually it could be just four. These centralizers are finite groups because we assume cuspidal and temple. And this conjecture, okay, maybe that's in the next slide. Ooh. <laughs> okay, I guess some words <laughs> have to be chopped out. So, so first, uh, the first comment is that you can remember this factor to the better. You can think of it uh, more concretely. Oops, quote unquote. <laughs> can I go on? Okay. Uh, <laughs> lecture is going to drift. So, uh, if you think of pi, uh, the transfer of pi to the appropriate GLN, well, it doesn't have to be cuspidal, even though pi itself is cuspidal but it lifts to or transfers to a product in the sense of parabolic induction of distinct cuspidal ones. Same thing for sigma. And this beta is simply the number of uh, things you induce. So if you induce for cuspidal, k is equal to one, otherwise not. And so that's connected to endoscopy, but anyways, that's a concrete quote unquote way to think about it. The local integrals converge uh, because of temperedness, because it just I mean, of course, one has to prove something, but this is soft. This is to see that the tempered matrix coefficients converge over H. And yes, and the statement is compatible with enlarging S, meaning that what you wrote here, if you just uh, look at unramified tempered coefficient, then you get really this factor up to this undescribable factor here, which is just doesn't depend on the representation. It just something very simple. Anyways, uh, so that's the conjecture. Ah, yes, I should also mention, of course, that uh, although it's not a tautology, it's still uh, the two sides are proportional. The reason is that they uh, both define for you uh, a functional with certain invariance property locally, if you like. And this functional is unique by results of uh, Eisenbart, Gurevich, Wallis, and Schiffman extended uh, Wallis Bosier for the uh, special orthogonal group, but it's basically the same. And and also you have to also to mention that this thing here it better be non-zero. And this also there is a, a result of uh, Vengadesh and Sakelaridis that such a matrix coefficient has to be, I mean the integral has to be non-zero if the representation admits such an invariant function. So to make a long story short, uh, it's all about this constant, if you like, this 2 to the minus beta. Uh, in other words, to show that this is the right constant. And in some lower run cases, this, uh, this was uh, known before. In fact, this conjecture is modeled after an old result of Walsperger, basically for SO2 inside SO3, so toric tor periods in PGL2. There are other interesting cases like SO3 inside SO4. This is, well, there are many people involved here, but one of the final results here was the result of Watson. And Ichino Ikeda, when they made this conjecture, modeled after Walsperger, they checked some other cases, um, but some other lower rank cases. In higher rank, this is in general not known. Uh, there is an important analog for unitary groups, and there is some recent very, uh, very important results of Wei Zhang where he really opens the door for this conjecture. In general, so far he has to assume some mitigating assumptions, but anyways, um, certainly a breakthrough in this direction. Okay, so this was just an introduction. I'm not going to speak about the gross prosad conjecture or the 
I should say the, the gross Poisson conjecture is about the non-vanishing of this. This is a quantification of that. OK, so far so good. OK, so let me turn to, to a Whittaker analog, so which it's kind of simpler. So now uh, let G be a quasi-split group and take a Borel subgroup with nilpotent radical n. Uh, take a non-degenerate character of n a trivial on n f. And we're interested in the Whittaker coefficient. This is a very useful gadget. Well, we'll set it just w phi if it's the identity. You can look at it as a function of g. Um, now, unlike in GLN, uh, this thing could vanish. So, caspidality doesn't ensure that this actually is non zero. So, we have to live with that, I guess. However, so, okay, what one can do uh, kind of naively is just to look at the things which are perpendicular to the space where it vanishes. Because then, for sure, by local multiplicity <laughs> one, this is guaranteed to be multiplicity free. The only problem is, of course, is what is this space? I mean, you can define it, but how, how do you really approach it? In GLN, it just means cuspidal spectrum, so that's fine. But for other groups, this is less uh, tangible. OK. So this we call cus uh, generic spectrum. In fact, it is cuspidal, at least conjecturally. But I could look at it as a discrete spectrum. But the thing is that you don't expect a residual spectrum to be generic. That's at least our experience and certainly the conjecture in general, although I don't think it's known. Uh, another thing I ought to say, of course, is that the generic spectrum is certainly uh, expected to be tempered. But of course, we don't know it for GL2 even. OK. Now, so I want to formulate something for the, for the Whittaker function. In other words, some analog of the Ichino Ikeda conjecture, which means that I want to, let's say, to test the absolute value of the Whittaker square against uh, some integral of matrix coefficients. So, what are the integrals of matrix coefficients? Well, let's just analyze this a little bit. So now let f be a local field. And I consider a generic irreducible, let's say, unitary representation. So it has a Whittaker model, space of functions which behave equivalently under psi on n. OK, now I want to consider this, this integral. So if I just imitate what there was before, I, I would just take the if you like, the Fourier coefficient of the matrix coefficient. However, technically, this converges, I mean, converges absolutely only if pi is quite takeable. Well, you can still make sense of it because you still have psi at your disposal, so this doesn't mean that there's some oscillation, possibly. So how do you make sense of it? Well, in the Piadi case, it's very simple. The integral stabilizes. What does it mean? That there is a large enough uh, compact open subgroup of, of this group in F, so that if you take any larger compact subgroup, the integral will be the same. And they'll, therefore, you just define the regularized integral, if you like, to be just this stable integral. So this, this set of compact open subgroups, this, of course, it's a directed set. We're talking about the unipotent group. So if you like, the limit of this thing limit of this net exists in the discrete topology. So that will be your uh, regular integral. Um, there is an alternative uh, approach, which, however, is only works for the tempered case. Well, you don't know that phi is tempered. I mean, if it's a local component, of course, you expect that. Anyways, uh, you can integrate over the derived group. That will converge absolutely if your representation is tempered, both in the periodic and dark median case. And then you can just take the Fourier transform, so you can think of this as a function in the other variable, the n mod n derived, so in the simple roots. And so it will be a function. In fact, it will be an L2 function. You could take the Fourier transform, which is L2, or 
in any case it would be distribution and this Fourier transform in fact is regular at the non degenerate <laughs> characters so you just take the value at that character so to make a long story short there is a way to make sense of this uh, this regularize uh, this integral Yes, and also this, this uh, object, okay, this Fourier coefficient of matrix coefficient, it behaves nicely with respect to parabolic induction in the following sense. So if you have pi which is induced, parabolically induced from sigma, sigma is on the levy, well, you take the, the opposite parabolic or, or the one conjugate to it, the standard one, you take the corresponding vial element and then there is the JK integral, which, well, okay, I write, I write it this way. You integrate um, over the open cell, well, just over, okay, just over U, and this is standard construction. And then what will happen is that the, the Fourier coefficient of the matrix coefficient upstairs is basically the same thing downstairs, but you have to take the JK integral. So the JK integral gives you a way, actually I haven't written it very precisely, it gives you a way from the, from going from the JK module, the twisted JK module of the induced to the twisted JK module of sigma. You have of course to be, to change the character a little bit, but don't worry about this, this is still a non-degenerate character. Anyway, so you can express uh, this in terms of the inducing data and the JK integral. This is purely formal calculation. And in particular, uh, since everything is induced from discrete series, or at least the quotient of it, well, so we could really just consider this one. I mean, the JK integral are holomorphic, so they don't cause any problem. And in particular, in the unramified case, that reduces uh, the computation of this thing to the computation of the JK uh, integral, which is it's a well-known computation. It's the kasselmann schleicher formula. And what it gives you in the unramified case, if you take unramified vectors and you compute its matrix coefficient and take this integral, it will give you uh, 1 over L pi adjoint up to some decoration factors. And that motivates the following conjecture that if you have now pi something generic globally now, then the absolute value Whitaker square is, again, okay, let me explain what this is later, but so you have one over L partial adjoint L function, which of course implicitly exists at non-zero, times some decoration factor, times exactly this uh, matrix coefficient and then taking four coefficient of it. So again, it has the yeah, same yeah, formula. I, I'm not so comfortable with having S. Usually you want a formula which has completed L function and then you have, uh, what is S? Is it just an integer? Well, S is anything sufficiently big. Any big enough. Yeah, and of course it's compatible because exactly because of this formula that I had before, that if you take a matrix coefficient of unramified case, that will exactly give you one over the L function. And uh, this formula is self-normalizing. It has the it doesn't depend on any choices, it's just homogeneous, so to speak. So, so this, this uh, formulation is uh, completely uh, kind of self-normalizing it. What are the one and L groups? Oh, these are just the degrees of the, from the invariance of the Val group. Okay, now, so the interesting thing here is how does it depend on this group of, uh, of the centralizer group that showed up before? Well, the centralizer group, I mean, it's some, you know, nice finite group. Uh, so if it's abelian, then I expect that this is the, just the inverse of the size. If it's not abelian, I'm not sure. I mean, maybe one can check a little bit G2. But in any case, I don't have any approach for this conjecture for E8, so. I'm not sure what it is. So it's some invariant of the group, maybe just the size inverse, maybe it's something more complicated. The number of is right? In terms of, it basically is just a oh. 
Yeah, but I'm, I'm talking about the Whittaker thing, so that won't help me. Right. Yeah. Anyway, so it's a little, uh, you know, under construction <laughs> what it is. I think G2 is the most uh, reasonable. Maybe one can, because there is an S3 there, and it's not impossible that one can see what it is. But in any case, it's some invariant depending on the group. <coughs> yes. Any questions so far? Yeah, so we yeah, of course, so <laughs> that's come next. <laughs> so maybe that will answer. OK. Yes. So what is the, I get it confused. So what is the, the, the Kevin side, top new side? Oh, oh, this is just the, the Fourier coefficient, but absolute value square. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, usual way. No, I just look at the at the at the e g equals e, just the oh, it's just a number. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so let's consider some examples. <laughs> uh, of course, the first example, the mother of all groups, is GLN. Oh, so that's just the, at the you value at the e. Oh yeah. gosh. Yeah. <coughs> okay, what happens for GLN? I mean, you don't make this conjecture if it's not true for GLN, right? Okay, so for GLN, the point is that Cast forms, some of the data for cast form, the Whittaker function tells you everything about the cast form because you can reconstruct simply the cast form by a well known formula of uh, Shalaika and Patrizki Shapiro, which expresses the cast form as a sum over the Mirabolic subgroup mod n. So the miraculous thing here is that you, have, you only need to sum the Mirabolic and then already it will be GLN invariant, one of the miracles of GLN. That's why it's called the uh, Miraculous uh, parabolic, parabolic. And of course, if you can express it, then you can express everything. So in particular, you can try to express the inner product. I mean, all this conjecture is about how to go between the inner product and the Fourier coefficient. So this is a ranking Selberg theory, in high rank uh, by Petesky Shapiro, J.K. Petesky Shapiro and Chalaika, which expresses the inner product as is a local inner product of the Whittaker function. So of course, uh, yeah, so this is the Whittaker function that was before. But then of course you get the, the partial L function, the ranking Selberg L function, and you evaluate it at S equals one. So this is a pole, this is a pole, and the value makes sense. So these are the fundamental, these are the exponents of GLN, one up to N. So this is one of the basic things in the ranking Selberg theory. And you can invert this relation. Instead of writing the inner product in terms of the Whittaker model, you can kind of turn the tables and express the Whittaker square as exactly this Fourier coefficient of matrix coefficient. So this kind of ubiquitous in this talk, Fourier coefficient of matrix coefficient. And of course, you have to switch it apart. Why is it true? How do you go from? from here to here? Well, it's actually it's a nice exercise, which is the analog of the unfolding, which is done in the global case. In other words, if you look at the local inner product, which is given by this formula, so again, you have this miracle that you integrate over a smaller subgroup. I mean, a pretty big one. I mean, co-dimension co n, but still a proper subgroup. And it's already GLNF invariant. This is a miracle, well-known miracle for 30 years or more. And, and now what you can do, uh, you can, so if you realize uh, this as your matrix coefficient on the Whittaker model, you take its Fourier coefficient, you get back just the value at the identity. So of course, again, this, this thing is trivially proportional, but the point is that the constant of proportionality is one. I cheated here because there are some constants here depending on measures, but it doesn't depend on the representation. That's the point. And 
to see, so you see the, this relation, this is exactly what you need in order to go from, from here to here. It just, it's formal. And what does this relation amount to? Well, let's just consider a small example of n equals 2. Well, what you have here, so on the left-hand side, well, you take the Fourier coefficient. Here it's just one-dimensional. And here it's uh, this inner product just integrating over the trolls. And then, okay, you shift. This is just the, the right translation. So that's your expression. But if you manipulate it, then of course you move the x out, so you get psi of tx here. And now what you have is exactly a case of Fourier inversion, right? So if you let this function in the integrand be phi of a, so it's not defined at zero, but okay. What you have here is just the, the Fourier inversion. So this is the Fourier transform of this function, this inner integral. And then you integrate the Fourier transform against psi inverse, so you get back the value at 1. So fortunately, you don't do Fourier inversion at 0, but at 1. This is because of the psi. So what you get back is just the value at 1. OK, and of course, in GLN, it works column by column. It's just completely parallel to what you do in the unfolding. Those are familiar. OK, so that's the GLN story. So it's basically ranking Selberg. Yeah, OK, forget about this. Um, OK, I mean, so the next uh, in difficulty after GLN is possibly SLN. Well, in fact, the SLN case follows from GLN because you can express the inner product of SLN in terms of the inner product of GLN. It just amounts to, again, a very simple Fourier analysis on you know, Edel's mode F star. Well, what will happen? So, of course, the Whitaker stuff doesn't change, right? Because N is contained in SL2. Uh, but the, the inner product changes. And what will happen is that you're going to get some constant of proportionality coming from the fact, exactly because of this small four analysis that you have to do, you have to count the number of Hecke characters uh, which for which pi tilde uh, is invariant by. Pi tilde is any representation which restricts to your given SLN1. So in the SLN, the L packets are easy to describe, at least for the cuspidal ones. They are just controlled by representation of GLN up to twists. And the size of the stabilizer, this actually turns out to be exactly the, well, if you believe the parameterization, if you believe the Langlands conjecture, then that's exactly the size of the centralizer. So you can measure it very concretely in terms of GLN. And it's a formal thing to go from the conjecture to GLN, which, as I said, follows from ranking Selberg, to SLN. OK, let's, let, let's turn on to, to the metaplectic case. Uh, so the reason that uh, we dealt with the metaplectic case and not other classical groups, well, this is not a classical group, but almost, is that at the time, okay, maybe I'll say later why we did that, but uh, so the metaplectic group is a double cover of the symplectic group, and as I said, it behaves like a classical group, but there, there is some change, some interesting change. Well, you can speak about for a coefficient, etc. And by the way, all the representations that I'm going to work with are going to be genuine, of course. So they are on the metaplectic group. They don't descend to SPN. So again, each such representation, generic, lifts to some representation of uh, GL2N in this case. So pi 1 up to pi k are representation of GL which of certain kind, and they are distinct, since pi is cuspidal, pi tilde. Anyway, so. The analog of the conjecture would be, so this is still, uh, I should say, a conjectural formulation, what's written here. So you see this uh, additional factor here that wasn't before. So before it was just this Fourier coefficient of matrix coefficient over L1 pi adjoint. That's what it translates here in terms of the lift. But here we also have something in the numerator. This is special to the metaplectic case. You don't see it for algebraic groups. And the reason that it should 
pop up is that, uh, well, it has to be compatible with S, right? If you enlarge S, you, won't, you don't want this to change, right? And the point is that if you now take the matrix coefficient, you do the same exercise that we did. You take the, metric, the unramified matrix coefficient and take its Fourier coefficient, you will have exactly this extra factor of L1 half. This is a local computation that was done many years ago by Manfred Bank Hofstein, and that's what it suggests. That. So again, morally speaking, this means that the Whittaker square is L1 half, but of course, you have to make it precise because you know this is a vector, so this also should depend somehow on the vector, but this is how it depends. So again, if you normalize, for L2 normalization, this wants to be this. That's what this roughly means. But it's a very uniform way to state it. Anyways, uh, yeah, so let's ignore this remark. So of course, for n equals 1, that's the answer to Peter's question for a few minutes ago, that in this case, we're talking about a very classical result of Paul's projet. He considers, I mean, it was, goes back to Shimura and other people. Um, Shimura asked, what is the, what are the Fourier coefficients of half integral modular forms on, uh, f I mean, the non-square free uh, Fourier coefficients? The other ones he was able to get, but what are the square free one? And the amazing answer is that uh, somehow it's connected to the value at one half of the lift. And sometimes, okay, there are some variants where you have to take the twist, but anyways. This is a famous result of Ward's I mean, or a version of a result of Ward's There are several of this kind. And Ward's used the machinery of the theta correspondence in his early work. But this, of course, is a little limited if you want to consider high rank because, uh, yeah. Well, then we need to skip back what the theorem was, the conjecture. Yeah. That's the theorem. Uh, yeah, sorry, th this is actually a, a conjecture. Yeah. <laughs> this For n equals one, yeah, that's a theorem. Yes, I, I should have made it clear. Right. Right. So we'll get there. So the lift in this context would mean that, uh, at, at the very least, that you look at the unramified parameters. It's still there is some Satake parameterization of unramified representation and you can attach to it an unramified representation of GL2n with the same parameters. And so the lift would mean that there is a representation of GLn which has the same or compatible parameters almost everywhere. So it's not unramified because it, it, it doesn't see the double tether. Yeah, so I actually I should, have, I should be more careful. The lift actually def depends on Psi. Ah, so I, I was careful, okay. So the lift depends on Psi. So uh, yeah, it's kind of strange. So there is, I mean, th there is the L function of, uh, like in the n equals one case, the Shimura L function, but it depends on psi, and it's the same dependence. So, and you want the L function on the GLN to be this uh, psi L function of the one on the metaplectic. So, so in the case of SL2, you go from the metaplectic cover of SL2 to PGL2, which is S of three. Okay, <laughs> that's maybe that's I said that's many that's things at once. So what I'm saying is that this is just a way to formulate uh, the conjecture to the metaplectic group. So you have this additional factor of L half pi, but you see that in, in this formulation, you actually use the lift in order to, to write here. I mean, I could have written here L psi of L half pi tilde. Pi tilde is what you start with, but I already wrote it in terms of GL Gl two n in this case. And, and the L psi one half pi tilde is defined somehow in terms of an integral or something like that. Yeah, you can you can define it on the ori originally on the metaplectic group by some kind of Shimura integral. It has extension for all n. Uh, but here I already kind of used the the standard L function on Gl two n. But I, I think I didn't answer the whole question. <laughs> because you look still uh, puzzled. Maybe it would be clearer to clarify for what is known about the Shimura correspondence in general. So if we, if, if n is one, then that we know what you're talking about, what L function is. If L function is the Shimura correspondence of the metaplectic forms, 
Yeah. Now, is that not in general, the Shimoa correspondence? Well, the Shimoa correspondence will somehow relate this conjecture, would basically would say that this conjecture for metaplectic is equivalent to the one on SO2 n plus 1, roughly speaking, if you worked out the details. But then you have the conjecture for SO2 n plus 1. So, so of course, for n equals 1, it's SO3, which is PGL2, which you know, but otherwise. So you, you need a different method. And the different method is based on the descent construction. What is the descent construction? Well, so this is a method by Ginsburg, Wallis, and Sudry. And it gives an explicit construction of functionality between generic representation of classical groups and those of GLN for appropriate N. Uh, OK, there is a book. And also, it has some second generation, but I won't get into that. Uh, as I said, I focus on the metaplectic group, although maybe it would be easier uh, to focus on other classical groups. But at the time when we started this project, which was too many years ago, the results were more documented in this case. Nowadays, the, the, this book gives other cases, but let's not worry about this. So I have to give you the basic setup. So you start with something on the GL2N. So we start with, from the lift, so to speak. That's why it's called the descent method. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, another method. I, I will describe. So you start with something on the GL2N, so the hypothetical lift. And you want to construct from it uh, something on the metaplectic group. Well, you start with not something arbitrary. You start with something uh, for which this integral, the GLN, GLN integral, is not 0. What that means is that the exterior square has a pole, and the L half pi is not 0. I mean, the L half pi shows its ugly face uh, all the time here, of course. And OK, now you do some, something strange. You go up. You go up to SP2N. So for me, SP2N is a rank 2N group inside GL4N. It's not, it's not SP2N. <laughs> and you, look, you take its Ziegler parabolic subgroup, which has Levy subgroup GL2N. So that's where you start it, right, the pi. And of course, you consider an Eisenstein series. Wait, this Eisenstein series induced from pi twisted by determinant of the S. What do you do with this Eisenstein series? Well, this Eisenstein series has a pole exactly because of this condition. In my normalization, it's S equals 1 half. It's a simple pole. It has a residual representation attached to it. And, and now what you do, you take some integral, which is called the Fourier Jacobi coefficient. I, I will not define it here. But it's some integral which gives you an automorphic form on a metaplectic group. So you start with something on the SP2N, and you get something on the SPN tilde somehow. In the center of this SP2N, there is a SPN. But somehow this construction lends itself to the metaplectic group, although we started from the symplectic group. That's how it works. So grosso modo, this is the construction. Of course, I didn't write, you, I didn't write the formula for you, but these are the ingredients. Right, so that's the usual. Uh, computation that this, yeah, the constant terms is given by this L function. Yeah. So the descent, by definition, is exactly the space of Fourier Jacobi coefficient, which, as I said, gives you automorphic forms on the metaplectic group. I mean, if you start with something arbitrary, this Fourier Jacobi would be just anything, right? It would be spread over the whole spectrum. But you start with kind of a small representation. And then it, the miracle is that this representation is going to be an irreducible representation. It's going to be a, a generic cuspidal representation. It's orthogonal, actually, to all things with 0 for a coefficient. And it has the right properties. So it lifts to pi in the way that I didn't uh, <laughs> explicate. But there is a way to make sense of it. It really lifts to pi. And it's irreducible. So this, so again, this, yeah. this lifting is a local thing. I mean, you, well, you can do it space by space. OK, so there is a local analog, but this is a global construction. But of course, but, but when you said lift to pi, that could be characterized locally. Yeah. Yeah. Or you can characterize by L functions. But of course, it amounts to a local. Yeah. That's so that comes. In their work, I'm sure S is, there are a lot of spaces thrown out when you're doing it. You don't compute that, right? OK, but. <laughs> I mean, that's why I started with this S from the beginning. I'm just trying to understand. 
Yeah, so they actually prove that it's irreducible, which amounts to some local... I mean, no, they, they certainly do some things locally, I mean... Okay, so your final So there are subtle issues if you want to formulate things in terms of local factors, but sometimes you can just uh, okay, it's, it depends on the formulation of on how how you want to formulate things. But fortunately for my purpose, I don't need to worry about these issues. <laughs> okay, so let me just tell you a little bit about the local theory. Uh, okay, I will not go into, it, it will be totally un incomprehensible, unfortunately. So you look at some induced space, you try to do the local analog. So you look at the induced space of the Whitaker space and you have intertwining operators, which, of course, when you talk about Eisenstein series, you have to consider, so they have local analogs. And then you look at a certain parabolic subgroup, exactly where you want to land. What is this yellow thing, by the way? That's strange. And you write some integral. I won't go into detail. It won't be very comprehensible. You write some integral. This integral is the local analog of the Fourier Jac Jacobi coefficient that I didn't define. Oh, G, G is always SP2N. So it's, it's the bigger group. And you descend to the smaller group. So G tilde is always in the metaplectic group. And bar means that you just project to the symplectic group. So you, you form some expression on the induced space, which gives you something on the metaplectic group. But this thing, as I said, it will be spread over the whole spectrum because you just started with anything in the induced. But the the point is that if you take a small representation, like the image of M1 half, the Langlands quotient, then you're in good position to get something irreducible. So that's the local descent. So Beta to make a long social... It uses the very representation, yes, but it's not the... Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's, I mean, you can, I mean, I won't say that there are no connections, but it is a different construction. I mean, you use the very representation, but not on a very big, you see, this is a very representation for a uh, Heisenberg group of rank, you know, of dimension two and plus one. It's not this huge. So it, it's really something genuinely different. And so the, the, the bottom line is that you can construct kind of physically the Whitaker model of the local descent, descent by some explicit integral. And of course, now we come to the, oops, the ranking Selberg uh, integrals for, for this pair, which somehow they, they're responsible for what's going on, if you like. So what are they all about? They're exactly about taking a Fourier Jacobi of some Eisenstein series and computing its inner product with the SPN. So phi prime is any cusp form on MPN now. And the computation is that this thing is, I mean, you have this L function, again, this L function depending on psi. But anyway, so this is kind of a Shimura type L function of metaplectic cross GL2N. You could do it for any N and M, but this is the case when you. And you have here the factors that the denominator that somehow comes from the normalization uh, of an electronic operator. And you have these local <coughs> integrals. These local integrals are kind of the local analog of this. So you have exactly this A that we had before, which gave you the descent if you put the intertwining operator against the Whitaker function. So I just want to, I mean, probably some of you are lost in this computation, but I want to get to one important point. Uh, yeah, so the descent somehow all the descent is all about having this uh, this L function having a pole at one or at, yeah so it s equals half in this notation. To to generate a pole, you really need to you know have basically this equals to that right. So that's where it comes from. You just take this to be the Fourier Jacobi, 
and then you kind of generate a poll. Okay. And you could do the same thing. I will just uh, go over it quickly. You can do it starting not from a Caspian representation, but actually a product of distinct Caspian representation. It's the same uh, method. There's just one change because you took the Eisenstein series from pi, not from a Caspian one. The pole will be not of order uh, one, but of order k. k is the number of gadgets. But otherwise, it's the same thing. And the theorem is that actually you get all the generic spectrum this way. So it's a combination of many people's work. But at the end of the day, what you get is uh, all the generic spectrum. OK, th you have to leave away the so-called exceptional representation. This is understood. Let me ignore this issue. But you get the bulk of the generic spectrum. You know what you'll get. And it comes not just, it's not just a qualitative statement, but you can, you have formulas here. I mean, you can compute the Fourier coefficient, for instance, of what you got. And what you get, maybe not surprisingly, is exactly the analog of <coughs> what I told you before, that you can write down the explicitly the Whittaker realization. So you get such expression like that. So you see here the constant term. So you get the Itotwanic operator. So so essentially what you have, I mean, this is a complicated expression, but the main thing here is the constant term, which you know how to write down. In fact, for any S, this is just the residue. But if you take the residue, uh, this is what you get. So you get this local thing that I described before, and you get this um, local, f I mean, this uh, global, excuse me, global factor. Note uh, one thing I want to mention is that you take a residue at S equals half of a function at 2S. So that's, that's where you get the 1 over 2k, just because of this uh, small thing. <laughs> this is the 1 over 2k. And on the other hand, so again, we want to compare two things, the Fourier coefficient and the inner product. So for the Fourier coefficient, OK, you have this formula that I mentioned before. For the inner product, well, that's the ranking selberg theory. I mean, the developed here by Ginsburg, Wally, Sudri, as I mentioned. And so it gives you this. Uh, composition as well. And what you get, so you get another uh, global factor. Well, actually, very very similar denominator, but the numerator is a little different. But here, you don't have this 2s. Here, it's s plus half. So when you take the highest term, then you just get, just get the limit without the 1 over 2k. So when you compare these two things, one came from the Fourier coefficient, which was basically computation of constant term, and the other thing was the ranking Selberg integral, then you get basically what you want. Remember, that factor was in the conjecture. But of course, you have the 2 to the minus k only in one of the, so it was in the previous slide, the 2 to the minus k appeared only in one expression. So the bottom line is that you can reduce the global conjecture to a local one, involves so of course, so far, I just ignored all these gadgets. But I'm not going to ignore them. I'm not going to. But I just want to explain that, that uh, this, this uh, computation just enables you to reduce the global conjecture into a local one. Um, let's see. So let me. Yeah, OK, so let me try to explain um, what is the local conjecture as much as I can. So <coughs> as I said, in the global uh, setup, let me go back a little. You started with certain Caspian representation of a certain kind. You have this in global integral non-zero, or you can phrase it in terms of L function. And then you produce something on the metaplectic group. Well, in the local case, you want to do something similar. But what do you start with? Well, the natural thing to start is simply the local analog, which is representation which admits a non-zero invariant functional under the GLN cross GLN. Because we started with the global integral non-zero, so the local component better have this property. So this is a nice class of representation. We are only consider the generic ones. 
and it's known that this, this is actually unique. And so let me uh, ignore some points here, forget about this for the sake of time. Uh, so this class of representation, it's a nice class. It's closed under parabolic induction, for instance. I mean, ignore this epsilon pi, I will not discuss it. Uh, it also has some representation, like if you take sigma induced with the dual, then it's also of this type. Forget about this. Forget about this, forget about this. Uh, so what is the local statement? As I said, this computation that I had before reduces the global conjecture into local one. What is the local one? So the local one is about uh, exactly this representation, which I call of metaplectic type, which admit this GLN, GLN, van factor, generic ones. And it says uh, that some integral is equal to some other integral. <laughs> like as <laughs> usual in the subject. <laughs> but so what is this integral? Remember, this was this uh, local ranking selberg integral. And this a psi, I guess long forgotten, was some other integral. But the feature here is that, I mean, this is kind of a bilinear form in the two thing in the just representations. But somehow the integral breaks them down into a product. So this is the interesting feature that this thing factorizes. And so again, it looks total, tautological at the beginning, except that it's totally incomprehensible. But, but it's not, I mean, it's not a Fubini type theorem. Um, yeah, n tilde is the, simply the nilpotent, the unipotent, maximally unipotent of the metaplectic group, or the symplectic group, if you like. So th this is the same feature this is like a matrix coefficient of the local descent, and you integrate it against a character, just like, remember, when I formulated the local conjecture, there was for a coefficient of a matrix coefficient. So this has the same feature. But it's, but now, now you have an answer for this. I mean, okay, if that's an answer for anything, but this is well defined. So m maybe just, uh, I'll, I'll show how it looks for uh, n equals 1. So <coughs> the theorem, I mean, I have to, f no, there are some theorems after all. Anyway, so the theorem is that we know how to, we know this local conjecture uh, in a, an important uh, special case, but still a special case, uh, where pi is a product of distinct supercluster. This is kind of the analog of the global uh, hypothesis. But of course, locally, it doesn't have to be satisfied. But at least in this case, we have it. But in fact, uh, we have most of the ingredients for the general case. So I will just state it as a, now it's fashionable to state quasi theorems. Anyways, so quasi theorem means that there are some details to finish, but we are a little co confident about them. But anyways, this is the first is basically written. OK, let me just uh, <laughs> show you how it looks like for n equals 1, the simplest case, which was known before by other methods, but I mean not in this formulation, but the, the conjecture itself. Anyway, so just to be concrete, what happens is that, so you write down this integral. So I just spelled out all the variables uh, on the board. It's 4 by 4 matrices, symplectic matrices, and somehow this seven-dimensional integral becomes this product of two integrals. And w what do you use in order to prove this? So these are for certain functions in some induced space. And all what you assume here about pi, just it has trivial central character because it's GL2. Well, the point is that the integral over t is just an inner product in GL2. So you're free actually to put any other variable in GL2 because it's an invariant inner product. So you just put in this element BB star. And then what the effect of it, of course, is just to change the character, you just conjugate. <coughs> so you change the character here. And now what you need to prove is that after this change of character, 
Well, you have, you have two expressions. One is still with the m1 half. Remember, that makes the representation smaller. So with the m1 half, actually, it's independent of t. Okay, so, so the point is that the only way that this can work out is that if one expression is independent of t. Okay, and then the other integrates to the other thing. So it's not directly so, but it's after you put this element b, which you're allowed to do. So, so what it boils down to is that this thing with the m1 half is independent of t. And then the other thing, when you integrate over t, well, it will give you the right thing. So, and the input here is, so you have to use some representation theoretic input. We already used one, the, the fact that it's an inner product. Now we use another one, namely that it's m1 half. m1 half means that it's small. It's a small representation. What does it mean that it's small? It means that it admits, so sp1 is sl2, it admits an sl2 cross sl2 invariant function. And most representations on, I mean, a generic representation on sp2 will not admit such an invariant function, but the image of m1 half will. And you use this somehow to manipulate this integral, and that will give you that this is independent of t. So this is, uh, this is somehow the ingredients for n equals 1 for, I mean, of course, I'm cheating because there are serious convergence issues uh, which we had to confront for <laughs> several years. <But laughs> anyways, the, in general, uh, there is something similar. You have to use some analog of the fact that this is an inner product. I mean, if you put GLN here, it won't be an inner product. However, you still have some interesting functional equation that if you take something on GL2N and you integrate the Whittaker square over GLN, well, against this factor. Well, there is a functional equation. Note that the constant of functionality is 1, unlike in the ranking Seibold theory where you have this gamma factor. This is just 1, and you have, uh, you can somehow translate it to another integral. Well, here you have some unipotent stuff. So this is one of the ingredients that you use for the general case, but there are many more which I will not um, get into. Okay, th there are actually some interesting uh, connection between this thing and uh, uh, the formal degree conjecture, but I think for the interest of time, I will just <laughs> stop here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Again, again, sorry. You had a conjecture <coughs> about generalizing both the J to general N, right? Yeah. At this point, it's a quasi theorem, is that correct? Yeah. It's, the, it's reduced totally to the local thing, which you think you can prove. Yes, exactly. So, more precisely, the, the quasi theorem, but so up to Archimedean factor, it's a quasi theorem, <laughs> let's put it there. <laughs> But a purely, depending purely on the Archimedean type of file. Because we certainly didn't have the patience to do the Archimedean. I mean, s some, some aspects in the Archimedean work, but it will be more, more serious. Right, so, so the, the theorem is with, with finite restriction, uh, with some restriction, the quasi theorem is that we can actually do it for all pi. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think we have the ingredients. It has to be written down uh, carefully. But what's written down right now is just the gosh. Yeah, just this case will. This case means that the descent is actually cuspidal or supercuspidal. Th these are these representations are relatively cuspidal. And. What it means here is that the descent will be cuspidal. But it's somehow, it's less serious than what you might think in terms of convergence issues. I mean, already here you have to somehow fight with. So I think most of the analytic difficulties are already in this case already. That, that's why I and have the liberty to.
Nope.